And now on to our dinosaur of the day, Inky Ornis. Hold on to your butts. This is a long one. <laughs> <laughs> I bring it up now because it's kind of mentioned in Jurassic World Camp Cretaceous. Darius mentions Inky Ornis as a possible new dinosaur in Jurassic World. And that was announced while he was visiting his father in a hospital. So it's somewhat in the canon. Ankyornis was a pear avian dinosaur that lived in the late Jurassic in what is now Liaoning, China, in the Tiaojishan Formation. It looks a lot like a bird, but with feathers on its legs, it also has teeth, and it's often depicted as having a lot of feathers on its head, almost like a crest. It's somewhat similar to modern birds. It's one of the closest relatives of aves. Anchiornis was about 5 to 10 million years older than Archaeopteryx. It was small with the four wings because it's got the feathers on the legs, so that's why we consider it four wings. It was about the size of a crow or a pigeon. Originally, it was estimated to be 13 inches or 34 centimeters long. That's a pretty big crow. Yeah. Yeah, crows can get pretty big. <laughs> The holotype was estimated to be 34 centimeters long, and according to the original paper on it, quote, reinforces the deduction that small size evolved early in the history of birds, end quote. Some specimens were larger, so they could get up to like 16 inches or 40 centimeters long and weigh 0.55 pounds or 0.25 kilograms. Overall, it was estimated to weigh about 0.24 pounds or 110 grams. Anchiornis was bipedal with a triangular skull, it had small, unserrated teeth, a slender, short scapula, long arms, long legs, and a long, bony tail. Its forelimbs were about 80% the length of its hind limbs. Oh, that's weird. Yeah, that doesn't seem particularly bird-like. Its hind limbs are still longer than its arms. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it had an elongate hind limb, so long legs, but it may not have been a strong runner because runners tend not to have a lot of hair or feathers on the legs. Oh, interesting. Yeah. It had four toes on each foot, and the third and fourth toes were the longest ones. The first toe, the hallux, was not reversed the way it is in animals that perch, so it probably didn't perch. And skin and muscle tissues of Anchiornis have been found. The type and only species is Anchiornis huxleyi. It was described by Xu Xing and others in 2009, the genus name Anchiornis means near bird, and the species name refers to Thomas Huxley, quote, who pioneered research into avian origins, end quote. Yeah, he was awesome. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he was one of the first to suggest a connection between birds and dinosaurs. And everyone thought he was crazy. I'm sure not everyone. <laughs> yeah, he got along with Darwin, but a lot of other people. <laughs> <laughs> now, the type specimen for Anchiornis is articulated. It is... However, missing the skull, part of the tail, and right forelimb. But the holotype includes cervical vertebrae, posterior caudal vertebrae, and, quote, faint feather impressions preserved on the slab and counter slab. Oh, yeah. Those feather impressions. Yes. Those are big news. <laughs> <laughs> and the holotype is probably a subadult or a young adult because of, quote, complete fusion of all the post-cervical vertebral neurocentral sutures, end quote. Things were fused, so they're thinking young adult. There are no lags. There was a second specimen found that was larger and more complete with long wing feathers on the hands, arms, legs, and feet. Now hundreds of specimens have been found, so we know a lot about Anchiornis. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, some of these localities in China, especially these birds in these early dinosaur bird hybrid situations, they find so many of them. Mm -hmm. So you get really good sample size and you can learn a lot about the animal. Just to give you an idea, the Shandong Tianyu Museum of Nature in Pingying County, China, reportedly has 255 Anchiornis specimens in their collections as of 2010. Oh, man, that is a lot. And that was 12 years ago. Yeah. So Anchiornis was covered in feathers. There were some scales. It had these long, narrow, veined feathers on the wings, legs, and tail. And it had two types of downy feathers on the rest of its body. It also had long feathers on its head that may have formed a crest. Its wingspan was up to 20 inches or 50 centimeters. The wing had 11 primary feathers and 10 secondary feathers, and they formed this rounded wing. 
The wing feathers were symmetrical, so that wasn't so great for flying. The longest wing feathers were near the wrist, so the wing was broadest in the middle and then it tapered near the tip that made it look more rounded. It had a flap of skin that connected the wrist to the shoulder that was covered in feathers that covered the gaps between those primary and secondary feathers. Now, unlike modern birds, the feathers were not arranged in tracks or rows. There was also covert feathers that covered most of the wing's surface, and it had the long veined feathers on the hind legs. Oh, they had veins on the hind legs, too. That does make them seem pretty wing-like. Mm-hmm. And these hind wings had 12 to 13 flight feathers on the lower leg and 10 to 11 on the upper foot. And the hind wing feathers were the longest closest to the body. So it did look like a four-winged dinosaur, similar to Microraptor. The feet, other than the claws, were also covered in feathers. It was a very feathery dinosaur. And the foot feathers were short and pointed downward. In 2010, there was a study that looked at melanosomes in Anchiornis feathers and compared them to modern birds. And the authors figured out almost all of the color of Anchiornis, except the tail, which was missing. Yeah, that was the first time I think I read about melanosomes. I read that paper not too long after it came out, and I was amazed. <laughs> oh, yeah? You read it in 2010? No, it was a couple years later. But, uh, but yeah, yeah, it's it was cool how much information there was. Now, the first dinosaur where we knew its color was Cynosauropteryx that had a banded orange and white tail. But I think we know more about the colors of Anchiornis. There's two types of melanosomes, eumelanosomes, which are black-gray shades. They tend to be long and sausage-shaped. And phao melanosomes, which are reddish to yellowish in color, they tend to be rounder and jelly bean-shaped. So knowing these types of melanosomes helps to figure out the colors in dinosaurs. And the study showed that Anchiornis had a feathered crest on its head. Most of its body was gray and black. The crown feathers on the head were reddish-brown with a gray base, and the face had reddish-brown speckles among mostly black feathers. The wing feathers were white with black tips, and the covert feathers were gray. There were larger covert feathers on the wing that were also white with gray or black tips to form rows of darker dots on the mid-wing. So it looked like stripes of even rows of dots on the outer wing and uneven speckles on the inner wing. I should mention the white and gray are a little bit more speculative than the brown and black, because like you said, the melanosomes, you can see the black coloration, or at least presumably black coloration, if the melanin matches with the melanosomes in the way we think it does, for those rounder and (laughs) sausage-shaped melanosomes. But for the white and the gray, it's usually more of an assumption like, oh, it's got eumelanin, but there's less of it. So then maybe it's gray or we don't see anything. So therefore it's white. But that's a little bit harder to determine for sure. It's pretty cool, though. If you were to search for images of Anchiornis, you would see all the paleo art looks the same, the coloring. And you never see that with like any other dinosaur. That's true. So the legs were mostly gray and the feet and toes were black. In 2015, there was a study of a different Anchiornis specimen that found only gray-black melanosomes without any reddish color in the crown. Oh, interesting. Yeah, it's possible that the melanosomes were preserved differently, or maybe there were different investigative techniques used, or the first specimen was smaller, and it could be that the reddish-brown color got replaced as Anchiornis grew bigger, or grew older. Or it could be due to some regional differences, or maybe there's even different species of Anchiornis. Yeah. Yeah, that's anywhere from it's the same animal and we detected it differently all the way to it's a totally different species. Yeah. <laughs> and anywhere in between. Yes. <laughs> in 2010, Chuango Li and others looked at the melanosomes of Anchiornis feathers and suggested the feathers were for finding mates or for other communication, like defense postures or for startling predators or sending warning signals. Hmm. In 2015, Johan Lindgren and others looked at the molecular structure of feathers in an Anchiornis specimen and found, quote, unequivocally that melanosomes can be preserved in fossil feathers, end quote, because there's some debate before about them being indistinguishable from microbes and skin tissue that colonize during decay. 
In 2012, Nicholas Longrich and others analyzed wing feather arrangement in Archaeopteryx and Anchiornis, and they found that they had multiple rows of feathers. It's found that Enantiornithines had modern wings, and the oldest one, Prototeryx, was from 131 million years ago. That's about 25 million years after Anchiornis, so it may mean that the wing feather arrangement in modern birds evolved over tens of millions of years and then stayed mostly the same for more than 130 billion years. <laughs> Ever since. Yeah. The feather arrangement packed together layers of relatively weak feathers, which may have made them strong enough to work like airfoils. They produce lift and drag when they're moved through the air, which would have been thicker than those in modern birds, increasing drag at low speeds and decreasing drag at higher speeds. The overlapping feathers would have made it really difficult for Anchiornis to take off from the ground. In 2017, Evan Seda and others found Anchiornis to have a, quote, shaggy, open-veined, bifurcated feather with long, flexible barbs attached to a short rachis, end quote. This is probably used for thermoregulation and repelling water, and combined with the open-veined wing feathers, quote, would have decreased aerodynamic efficiency. But Anchiornis did look fluffy. It's good to know. <laughs> in 2019, Yan Hong Pan and others analyzed Anchiornis feathers and found alpha keratins, which are usually only found in modern feathers, and beta keratins, which were modified in a way that made the feathers more flexible. They analyzed the feathers from Anchiornis and compared them to other fossil feathers and modern flight feathers from like, chickens, geese, ducks, emus. And they found that modern birds had mostly beta keratins in mature feathers, whereas Anchiornis had beta keratins and alpha keratins in its feathers. So this further showed that feathers may have at first evolved for reasons other than flight. And this means that this modification happened earlier than we previously thought. Flight feathers were thought to evolve about 145 million years ago, and Anchiornis lived about 160 million years ago, so Anchiornis feathers help show how feathers evolve for flight. Maybe. Maybe. <laughs> and originally, Anchiornis was thought could fly or glide, but later it was found that the wings were too short. In 2016, a study found that juvenile Anchiornis may have been able to use its wings to help run up hills, and maybe it could fly while flapping if it was using a high-angle flapping wing stroke, but then adults would have been too heavy to fly. If it was flapping while running, it would have sped it up by about 10%. And if it was flapping while leaping, that would increase the height and distance by around 15 to 20%. Yeah, it's not nothing, but it's also not particularly impressive. Yeah. In 2009, Xu Xing and others, when they described Anchiornis, they wrote, quote, some wrist features indicative of high mobility, presaging the wing folding mechanism seen in more derived birds and suggesting rapid evolution of the carpus. And they said that Anchiornis, quote, represents a transitional step toward the avian condition. So it had a more avian-like wrist than other non-avian theropods. And the avian wrist, for birds, they're modified for wing folding and flying. In 2014, Xiaoting Zheng and others analyzed 226 Anchiornis specimens because, why not? We have that many available. <laughs> <laughs> they didn't quite use all of them because you had 255 as of 2010 in one museum. Yeah, I guess so. They also analyzed 96 Sapiornis specimens, and they found no sternum in either Anchiornis or Sapiornis. Oh, that's a problem if you're trying to fly. Yes. So neither Anchiornis nor Sapiornis may have had a sternum, which, quote, could represent the plesiomorphic avian condition, end quote. The ossified sternum is sometimes missing in fossil birds, but not having a sternum, quote, suggests that flight capabilities would be severely limited in basal birds. So, sternums are important for flight. They found that in Anchiornis and Sapiornis, the absence of these sternal elements are, quote, a true feature of these taxa and not an artifact of preservation or ontogeny. Yeah, if you've got over 200 to work from and you can't find it in a single one of them. Then it seems like you can rule it out. <laughs> Sometimes absence of evidence is evidence of absence. <laughs> yes, and they did histology on the specimens too. They found them all to be mature. Mm. It's possible that gastralia may have supported the muscles needed for gliding if they glided, but that's not clear. 
There was a 2010 study by Alexander and others that did find Angiornis to be a glider. In 2014, Garnet Fraser suggested the long legs of Angiornis could be related to, quote, dorsal riding parasitic behavior, end quote. It was riding on the backs of other animals and used for, quote, running, jumping, and climbing over plates and spikes. The need for a gliding dismount would explain long feathers on these long legs. That is quite a hypothesis. That would be so fun to see if <laughs> the, that was true. It evolved long legs for hopping around <laughs> plates on animals. Yeah. And then would glide off. And the <laughs> glide off to dismount gracefully. <laughs> yeah, that's maybe. Maybe it did that. That's really fun to think about. Probably not. <laughs> Anchiornis had large claws on the third digit of its foot, in addition to its sickle-shaped second claws. The foot pads were covered in small pebble-like scales, and it had scales on the top of the feet. Some Anchiornis specimens had scales on the toes, tarsus, and lower leg, so maybe there were some scales beneath the feathers. Anchiornis had three clawed fingers, where the longest two fingers were stuck together with skin and tissue from the wing, so... Basically, it only had two fingers. The skin around the bottom of the fingers and the toes were covered in tiny rounded scales. In 2018, Xiao Ting Zheng and others studied six gastric pellets that were attributed to Anchiornis, which had been, quote, lightly acid etched lizard bones or fish scales. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. A little bit of gut contents for you. A little bit. You know how much I love gut contents. This made Anchiornis the earliest, most basal-known theropod known to produce gastric pellets. And it's the only definitively known gastric pellets from any non-avialin theropod. And these pellets were similar to those of modern birds. And just as a quick aside, pellets are undigested food parts that are regurgitated. Yeah, because they can't be swallowed or they don't want to swallow them. Mm -hmm. All the way down, at least. I guess they're swallowed part way they're in the stomach but they don't get all the way into the intestines for digesting yeah now this helps show a digestive system similar to modern birds quote and that the evolution of modern avian digestion may have been related to the appearance of aerial locomotion in this lineage end quote and birds probably not a big surprise they have a high metabolism Inchiornis had a two-chambered stomach efficient Anti-peristalsis, it propelled food from the stomach back up to the mouth. Low stomach acidity and short gastric residence, which may mean that this really specialized digestive system, which is also seen in birds, was ancestral in paraves or even Manoraptora. The regurgitating would have improved paraves digestion, like how efficient it is, which may have helped give it energy for aerial locomotion, and then early paravians could also have quickly gotten rid of any non-digested food to make themselves lighter quickly. Now, Inchiornis was probably an opportunistic generalist hunter, as were many dinosaurs. Three lizard skeletons were found in one pellet, or the presence of them were found in one pellet. Wow. Fish may have been a big part of its diet, based on five of the six pellets containing only fish scales. Oh, wow. Yeah. So maybe its longer legs have more to do with waiting or something than dancing around stegosaur plates? Maybe. I mean, Anchiornis, though, didn't seem great for catching fish because compared to birds that live near water, it had a lot of feathers below the knee. Oh, yeah. And it had a relatively short snout. And usually birds that catch fish have long, slender bills. Oh, yeah, that is super weird. Usually you don't want a bunch of feathers in the water when you're yeah. trying to walk around. <laughs> now, the fish found could mean that Anchiornis could catch some fish, or maybe there's a preservation bias for these fish-bearing pellets, and we don't actually know the true diet of Anchiornis. It's just this one particular set of pellets. Anchiornis lived in a subtropical to temperate climate. It was warm and humid. And other dinosaurs that lived around the same time and place include other bird-like dinosaurs, like Aurornis, Saracornis, and Xiaotingia, and the heterodontosaur Tianyulong. And other animals that lived around the same time and place included pterosaurs, salamanders, insects, arachnids, and mammals. 
For those of you who listen to our Dinosaur of the Day segment and you like it, please consider becoming a patron. We take new Dinosaur of the Day requests from our patrons and offer a bunch of other perks as well. So check out our page at patreon.com slash I know dino or click the link on the left.